Okay, so uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, can you see my Safari window browser there? Yeah. Okay, and I'll close mail down here too. And let's hide that. Hmm. And so what I did is a couple of days ago, I went through and I looked at, these are all aliases pointing to the applications folder because the ones that I don't use on a regular basis, I'll go back and trash. And what I did is as I, I, I set my, I went into the app store and started picking every app that was either, not every app, but every app that I thought had any value that was free um, and I downloaded it. And then I went into Finder and um, looked at those. Uh, I'll show you exactly what I did. We'll go to application here. And clicked on uh, date modified. Come on. And you can see all the ones that have got those purple spots after it. Those are ones that I've downloaded. I, I, I added a tag to them or a label to them with, and just picked the color purple so that, and sorted them by the, when they were installed so that I, if I decide, hey, I'm not gonna use debit and credit and I'm not gonna use home budget and I'm not gonna use bear and I'm not gonna use world of tanks. I can select them all and then drag them all to the trash. And although the app store will keep tabs on what I downloaded once before, I won't physically have them here if I'm not using them. So that was what I did to make life easy from that standpoint. Um, one of the few things that, that I like the way that that works. Let's go back over here to this window again here. So anyway, that's what these all are right here. Like an idiot, I didn't, uh, there we go. So let me go over a few that, that either are free or damn near free or still worth the investment. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them that I'm using on a regular basis. One is Alfred. This is a free app. You can just type in Alfred. I think it's even, I don't know if it's available on the app store or not. I didn't check that. Um, but it is available free and um, it does come up uh, with an option to have the icon up here in the menu bar. I, for when we have our meetings, I usually turn off about half the junk in the menu bar. But I've got an option for that. Oh, it's probably here under bartender. Nope, it's not. All right, I've got it just turned off at the moment. Here's what I like about Alfred. When you, when you actually open up the application itself, or when you, I use shortcut keys, you can type anything in. So it uses the search database that the built-in spotlight search has. But let's say as an example, I want to go to Safari. Got to learn how to type. It starts looking at the letters as you're typing them in, as you're typing them in. And you can choose the order, whether you want it to search through apps, through docs, through websites, you can, you can do it all. And you can see right there, out over here at the right hand side, if I hit the return, it'll take me right directly to Safari. And let me hide that back. But when I had, when I had, if I go back to that again, you can see if I wanted to go to that in uh, Linda Stafford or Safeguard, those are two that happen to be, that happen to have SAF in them in my uh, contacts list. I can do a command two or a command three and go directly to those. So like if I do a command two, it's gonna bring up, uh, in this particular case, it's bringing up the application to open any files that didn't look to see which one it was picking at. But that's what it's, it doesn't know what else to do that. That's because I've changed uh, uh, something uh, with that. But I like Alfred, I, I'll tell you why. I'm sitting here working along and if all of a sudden I wanna get into, oh, um, let's say I use Fantastic Cal, so I can type in F8 and there I am, there's Fantastic Cal. Or if I wanna to go to something OACC, there you can see the options that I have for OACC, those four that it comes up with something that it thinks I'm looking for. Or maybe I'm looking for something with the company I used to work for, GDR, and there's, there's GDR. This is much more efficient uh, for quick access, and it's not near as in depth as what the Safari, the Spotlight utility would be. But for um, if I'm in Photoshop as an example, and I go into Photoshop, but really what I wanted, oh gee, I also have Power Photos, and I have Tutorial, anything that had the word PH, uh, letter PH, is pretty convenient. So. Alfred is a freebie. Now they sell a version of it as well. The version I use is freebie. They sell what they call the power pack. 
it's like 10 bucks and that gives you global search across the internet as well. I tried that at one, I tried the trial on that. I didn't find a real use for it. So I chose not to buy it, but Alfred's one that I think is well worth having just for the convenience. Well, then, I'll tell you something, ahead. Greg, what you showed just now made me kind of quite excited because the thing is, is that there's one thing I hate is, is going to spotlight and trying to find something. Yeah, it, 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 it spotlight does a good job, but it's just bulky, I think. And it, it's klutzy. It, I, I don't think they've made improvements over the years, especially like as an example, it limits to what you see in the initial search. And then you've got to go, you know, then you've got to scroll all the way to the very bottom and click show and find it and then go click show and find her again a second time. Yeah. To get an that's so stupid. I don't understand why Apple did that. That that makes no sense to me at all. But yeah, yeah, where did you find Alfred? Uh, you can just go to Google search and just type in Alfred and you'll see productivity app that'll come up. Like I said, I think it's available in the app store. I think well, we'll find out here in a moment. Another quick comment before you said uh, GoPro, check out uh, Geek Pro. I've got a Geek Pro at 99 bucks. There we go. So there's Alfred right there is available from the app store. Okay. Uh, that's my personal preference. Now that's probably, that'll be the basic version. Um, but there's an option to click on and go ahead and get the productivity pack. Like I said, I didn't find a use for that productivity pack and I didn't really want to, you know, 10 bucks is cheap, but I mean, if you're not going to use it, you're not going to use it. And I got a lot of crap over the years that I haven't used. So a lot of the stuff, what I'm talking about is available from the app store. Let's just leave that open in the background. That's really handy. Yeah, okay. okay. Then, in the Unix world, since this is what the Macs are underneath, it's not uncommon for you to have multiple, pro multiple, you know, Unix is a multitasking system. So it's not uncommon to have multiple things running at the same time. And uh, uh, Ron, like we are, uh, Mario, like we were talking about with Carbonite, one of the problems that you have is um, there are some times where Carbonite, is just eating up resources like it's going out of style. And there are other applications that do that as well. So in the Unix world, you could go into terminal, and I'll bring up a, a terminal session real quick here. And I haven't even bothered to, I haven't even changed this since the last time I added operating system. But you could look at, you could type in, uh, let me widen this window up here a little bit. And you could type in PS space dash EF. And this shows you all the processes that are currently running on this Macintosh. And then you can use different other flags like the dash EF to, to limit it down to what to, uh, you can also do uh, a straight PS. It doesn't really show very much. Yeah, no, it does by itself. So you really need to use the flags. Well, anyway, these are all eaten up. Each one of these columns is telling you for like CPU percentage and memory percentage and all that information. Then, and finally, out here at the very end, if I highlight one of these, like here, you can see that that's the actual file that that process is running. Uh, that's where it's physically located. It's physically located under the under the root level at system in system library in system library frameworks slash webkit dot framework slash. Okay, fine. That's great. If you're if you're into Unix and you know what you're looking for, that's fine. But that's a drag. But there's a uh, there's a cool feature in Unix called nice. And what and what nice is, think of it as kids playing nice with each other. That's the way I always remember it. And so there's a default level of nicety to every process that's running. I know this is getting really busy. So if you had something like carbonite, maybe carbonite's eating up 60% and you only want it to eat up 10% or whatever it is. You don't mind it eating up 60% when you're not doing anything like we are right exactly right this moment now. But as soon as I move the mouse around, resource has to be added to the mouse. Resource has to be added to the display. But when I'm not touching anything on the keyboard, it's just whatever stuff is running in the background. Uh, it can, it can, I don't care if it wants to run at 100% of CPU power. I don't care. It's just that when I'm doing two or three or four things, maybe I'm uh, editing, maybe I'm processing a video, maybe I'm downloading something. I want to sometimes give priority to a specific task. You can do that in a terminal session with the nice command, but it's a pain for most people. Here's a program that I, 
and, and oh, by the way, we can go into um, Activity Monitor, which is built into Max. And if I go over here and look, click on the CPU window, you can see all the things that are currently running. It usually sorts them. It's sorting from the from the worst. So like Zoom, the program that's running our web interface right now, you can see it shows that I'm running at 182.4%. That's because there's four CPUs in this particular computer. And then eyeglasses, which is a utility that I personally use uh, whenever I'm doing video, uh, a web-based video, eyeglasses is eaten up. So you can see, there, the, you can see the percentages under CPU are changing as, as other things are, are robbing more or taking more away. Again, you can go through and you can set uh, you can set some options up here for making these games, making these things play nice. Well, here is a free program called App Priority. I found this on Google when I was looking around looking for nice. And App Priority goes into activity. Come on, let's see a window here. There we go. And I can go in here and see just things that I have control over. That PS stat issue command that I have, unless I'm locked in as root, I don't have access to everything. But you can see right here, I have access to, to uh, eyeglasses, to app priority, to iStat menus, to this WD drive agent. I thought I had gotten rid of that, so that means I'll go back and I'll take that out at some point in time. This shows all the things that are running that are attached to my login <laughs> name. Uh, that Adobe Demon, I'll get rid of that because I'm not, I, I, except when I'm using Photoshop, I don't want any Adobe crap running in the background anymore. All these are eating up. Now, there's, you can see that they're eating up almost nothing percentage-wise. But this, this utility allows you to go in there and specify a particular process. So I can come in here and let's say, I'll, I'll click this one, Adobe, and I'm going to suspend that app. Okay, yeah, sure, go ahead. I'm trying to remember how, there we go. So I'll pick uh, the WD drive agent. Come on. My fingers are acting up today. Okay, 486. Oh, okay, here we are. This pop-up's giving me the control to them. So here I can come down here. These are the programs that I have direct access to. And I can so I can pop these into that window there. And then I can either suspend it or release it either way I want to. So that you don't have to kill the process. You can reduce its speed. So like if I'm transcoding a video in the background, I use a, a handbrake all the time for that. And Handbrake will eat up a lot of CPU resource. Well, if I'm watching TV, I don't care. But otherwise, I'll go in here and I'll select Handbrake and I'll reduce it down to minimum so that it's not affecting other stuff that I'm working at, except when I'm not doing anything on the keyboard or, or using another program. So this, this is a free program. You really can't do any damage because worst case scenario, you would log out, log back in, everything would start back up again. You can see that I can suspend apps or I can resume apps. So I can come through here and resume this if I wanted to. And now it's taken it out of that currently suspended application folder. So that's a nice way of, of like if you've got Carbonite running, sort of like the pause for 24 hours Mario, you could go in here and suspend Carbonite and um, kill it, temp not kill it, but temporarily suspend it to where it doesn't get any access or it reduces the access and come back. I think this is a really useful utility for anybody who runs across those situations. And that's called App Priority. That one you have to do a Google search on, but it is called App Priority. Man, just a little stubborn about getting rid of itself here. How about that? Greg, you know, I might make some suggestion to everybody. Um, it might be a good idea if they did a screenshot on that window right now. That way... Uh, well, yeah, that is a good idea. You're right. You know, you know what? I'll do that and I'll send it out to everybody. Yeah. Because I did that just a little. I should have done that. I didn't even think about that, Steve. Really good idea. All right, because there's so many, I'm going to go through these then. Audio Hijack. This is a this is a free piece of software that's available uh, that you should probably get. It's from uh, Bajango, I think. Uh, no, I'm going to pass on that for right now. 
but this is a, uh, a free piece of software that gives you a lot of uh, capability for uh, converting ro uh, audio, uh, um, for scheduling, for since I don't have it installed running right now, it's going to want a new session. I think this is one you should think about if you do anything with audio. Bartender, this was one that Adrian turned me on to. In fact, I've still got the icon up here running. If you've ever been in a situation where you've got so many little menu items up here, you know, as you keep adding them, they keep creeping over here to the left, to the, to the left. What, okay. bar, what uh, Bartender does, Bartender gives you a, an, extra, uh, an extra control bar across the top. I don't think you can have more than two, but you might be able to. And you can interactively choose which ones you want to put into a bartender. So like when I come in here and go into preferences, it brings up the bartender menu. And right now here, I'm looking at one password mini because I use one password. I can show in the bartend bartender menu, I want it to be hidden there. But in the uh, regular menu bar, I want it to be shown by default. So I can select which ones show up in which bars or always show in the menu bar regardless. So like in the case of 1Password, here's my 1Password shortcut. When I click on Bartender, there it is there so that I can get access to it on either one. But if I have some of these up here that I hardly ever use, here'd be a good example. This is iStat menus, which we'll talk about in a moment. I can choose to not have those always displayed up here, but if I want to see them, all I got to do is come over here. There's a keyboard combination and click on this one and it will show up in this menu bar. So that's kind of nice for the ones that you'd like to leave up here all the time but you don't want them sucking up all the space, but you don't want to have to, you, you want to have some way of getting to them real easy. Bartender is pretty reasonable. It's about 10 bucks, I think, something like that. Now that, that, that has really come in handy for a lot of uses. That's what Bartender 3 is. Here's a freebie from the App Store, battery menu. And I use a couple other different battery menu things, but this might've led me to some indications. This is its icon right here. Come on, let me hide that again. So let's go take a look at battery menu. And you can see right there, it's showing the status of my battery. Obviously this is only really useful for anybody with a laptop, but it shows like right now, my battery capacity is 92% out of 100, which is what it was orig originally. So it's 100% charge right now, but overall wise, it's really only 92% of its, of its value, even though it's plugged in and it's not actually charging at the moment. Because remember, as you can see in the five years that I've had this computer, it's only had 75 full cycles of running it down and charging it all the way back up since I leave it plugged in all the time. So it shows you all the status of everything. It's a quick little shortcut to see what your battery status is like. You can come in here into its preferences and in the preferences it allows you to set things like warnings or show, show more information up here in the menu bar. See right there, I can see the 100% up there if I look in the menu bar of what it's, show how much battery time do I have left? Well, since I'm not running on battery, I unplug my power, you'll see. It'll show up in just a moment there. Or not. Let me plug that back in. And so you've got some controls. And since this is a freebie, I paid for fruit juice. Since this is a freebie, it's uh, well worth looking at, I think, because it's kind of hard to beat the price. I've got, so I'm going to turn that one back off. Beamer, here's one that's, oh, this is like eight or 10 bucks. And if you're into an Apple TV, if you've got an Apple TV, you know that you can't always show every video kind format like, like uh, flash videos, FLVs, or some of the Windows media. You can't play those from your computer onto Apple TV. Beamer will let you, let you do that. So you can drag, when you've got Beamer running and you've got your Apple TV turned on, you can drag any kind of video file you want into Beamer and Beamer will on the fly reformat it to play up there on your Apple TV. That's what that does. Bear, this is a note taking application. This is kind of interesting. It's uh, if, you're, if you use the note utility and you'd like to use it more often, but have, have a little more flexibility, that's what Bear does. I don't know where they came up that name from, but. Okay, Be Funky Express. This is a set of color filters that are available that you can apply to various photographs. This is a freebie that's available from the app store. Blotter, I used to use this when I was working all the time. And what I liked about it is, would like to access your reminder, sure, why not? And sure, it's gotta do that. 
and there we go. I'm going to hide this window temporarily. You can see what it does. It gives me like a desktop blotter. Now it's not it's not set up right now, but it would normally show anything that I had set up. There we go. It's populated it. So you can see all the time. This would be just like a regular desktop blotter on on a physical desk, a paper blotter, where you peel each each month's page off. And as you add stuff to your calendar, it shows up here in an overlay. You've got a, a whole bunch of different choices for uh, alignment, for setups. Do you want to see regular things for, for uh, color choices, for density? It shows up a little darker now. And then eventually, after like a minute or so, this will lighten up. But that's a quick way to see what things you've got planned for the week. It was really great when I was working and needed it. And I don't need it so much anymore. So consequently, I don't use it on a regular basis anymore. And now I'm trying to remember, since I haven't used it for a while, how to turn it back off. Well, this always works. And of course it doesn't. Okay, so where is the shortcut for blotter? Oh, it's probably on this page. I forgot to look over here. All right, well, the hell with it. We'll move on. I'll come back to that in a moment. Boom 3D, I'll talk about this one. I've got it turned off at the moment. One of the drawbacks, one of the things that I notice on the um, on, on the Mac laptops, not a lot of laptops, is the volume's not loud enough coming out of the built-in speakers. And what Boom 3D is, is just a slight volume increase. You can take it to, you can take it to about double the volume. This sells for about $12, I guess. Um, I use I now use either my headphones that I'm using right now, or I use a, a set of little stereo speakers, um, because I, over the five years I've blown the speakers out inside the laptop, and if I was going to tear the laptop apart, I'd replace them. But you know what? It isn't worth the money to tear the laptop apart to replace the speakers when for fifteen dollars you can buy a, a set of speakers that work fine. But what Boom does is it allows me, if I'm playing music or a movie or something, sometimes they're just not loud enough to be able to get back. Boom allows you to get around that. And it's now available for iPads and iPhones as well. It doesn't work quite the same way. What it does on the iPad and the iPhone, it takes the existing video, it doesn't do on-the-fly audio like, like this one does, but it'll, taste, it'll, it'll take any existing file and increase that file and make a, like a secondary copy of the, of the file that you can work with that gives you more uh, loudness to work with. All right, Cadintosh X, I ran across that. I haven't used it for a while, but what that is, that is a uh, CAD application. Pro All these have a 30-day trial. If they're not totally free, they have a, at least a 30-day trial for you to try out. So if you're looking for an easy CAD program to do some simple layout, that's a good one to look into. Carbon Copy Cloner, this and SuperDuper, the group has talked about this lots of times. This is the one that I use all the time. Um, as you can see over here on my desktop, I have this GJL Photos backup. Well, that that little device is um, that little guy is a um, 128 USB flash drive that I've got plugged into the side uh, of my uh, com of my computer. And um, as paranoid as I am with my Photos backup, I've got Carbonite, I've got Google Photos backup, although I'm using the free version of Google Photos. I've got um, Apple's iCloud backup, and I'm paying for that. I'm paying a, a, a buck a month for, for the 50 gigabytes with storage or whatever it is for that. Um, so that's backing up some documents and stuff, but mostly my photos. Um, but every night at 1 a.m., I and I've also got Time Machine running, but every night at 1 a.m., I have a uh, carbon copy cloner process that starts up, <laughs> backs up my photos directory onto this 128 gig. Um, flash drive here and also backs up a few of these other things. And um, so that just gives me another comeback. Now carbon copy cloner by itself and same with super duper, 
if you just want, if you just need to do a one-time backup, well, you can do it as often as you want, but if you just need to do a full backup of your hard drive onto another drive be before you make any modification, the initial free demo versions of both Carbon Copy and Super Duper will do that for you for free. I used it when I had that problem with the Carbonite. Yeah. Everything up. I went to Carbon Copy and I wiped out my hard drive and reloaded it from Carbon Copy Comic. Perfect. Yeah, it works great. And the nice thing is, here you can see the only the only session I've got set up right now is this one that runs every night. And if I come over here and I take a look at it, you can see that um, it's I'm having it do copy some files. This is all. This is all. By the way, this program's like twenty six dollars. A weird price they came up with. One's like twenty three dollars, and the other one's like twenty six dollars. They both pretty much work the same. If I come on down down here to advanced settings, you can see this is what I'm having it do stuff. I'm having it take my pictures folder, copy files from my pictures folder into this photos backup uh, uh, drive that I've got. I changed the, I customized changed the icon so I'd see what it looked like. That runs every night, runs it runs daily, and then I tell it when I want to, um, what time I want to. There's an option when you set it up to to do that, and then I it only sends me it can send you an email every time it runs, or it can send you an email only when it has error. So if I if I've unplugged that little USB drive for whatever reason and it tries to run tonight, it'll send me an email. It'll send me an email saying drive wasn't available, and that'll remind me. Oh, idiot! Forgot to plug it back in again. This I use this program not only for this little dorky little feature here, but for the longest time before I started getting more and more into Apple Music, or excuse me, Apple TV and videos. Um, when I was getting videos from other places, let's say. Um, I was backing those up from my internal drive here onto external drives, and I had three or four different tasks that would run at different times. So even though Time Machine checks every hour on the hour, and um, I would have, like at 1 a.m., I would have it back up my, my movies drive that I had plugged into this Macintosh onto another drive so that in case I lost the drive, I wouldn't have to re-download them all again. And I would have it back up my TV shows drive onto another drive. Again, for the same thing, it would do that at three o'clock. They would they could both run simultaneously. But I just that in my head, I figured I'm not doing anything in those hours. Might as well have one do it at one and one do it at two or three or whatever it is. But I use Carbon Copy Cloner now primarily for backing up either customers stuff whenever I'm doing some work for a customer, or for this photos things I do. Or like as an example, if I want to wipe out the hard drive in here completely, I'll take an external drive, plug it in, and do a full backup of that external drive, of, of my internal drive onto the external drive so that I can now not only boot to that external drive, but I can reformat this internal drive and start from scratch if I want to make a 100% clean install. And Apple gives you the ability to be able to do that as long as you've got internet connection to pull the files directly off of Apple, or in my case, I leave a copy of High Sierra sitting on another drive so I don't have to waste the download time. So at the very least, you should get either Super Duper or Carbon Copy Cloner to have in your toolbox at least the free versions because at least you can do that with it. I just find that's really a useful program. I talked about Card Hop before, and I'll go over it real quick. This is made by the same people who make Fantastical, which I'll also show. What I liked about Card Hop is here's a shortcut to get into um, to get into the contacts list. I can go into the contacts list and leave that running, but um, let me move this out of the way. But I, as an example, if I want to see uh, uh, Steve Spiegel, as I start to type in names here, oh, it's coming up as new contact. There we go. I want to search all contacts. There we go. So you can see if I if I it, it automatically brought up Steve. This is pulling the contacts information that I have in my contacts book, and it even shows the one that I had made up for his wife. Um, and then it shows other people. There's obviously there we go. Will Decker. He was a they found Steve Spiegel in, in how how is the connection made? Well, Will Decker came through um, Linda Fishback because I had added her. At one point in time, oh, I think Steve had turned turned her on to me. 
So there we go, we got some issues down here. You can see from back in 10.63 days. So this is really good for getting into stuff real quick. Where I find it really comes in handy is that I can um, be looking at a website and if I see a name and address or whatever it is, in fact, I should probably show you an example of how that works again real quick. The group that I'm going to Alaska with, this guy has published some tremendous things. And let's look at the most recent. I've probably got it in here. Uh, participants, here we go. So here's a preview file that's got all the people supposedly that are going on the Alaska trip. And I thought, wouldn't that be convenient? Because he's got cell phones on there for everybody. Wouldn't that be convenient if I had some way of getting that here into my contacts database? And because this is a PDF, there was no way to, to do it exactly. But what I could do is I could select all this information, let's say here, and do a right mouse click and services, send to card hop. And look at that, it's, popular, it's popularized all the stuff already into card hop. Now, because this is one that I already had in here, I went ahead and added them to the groups. That's what you see up here in, in the little highlighted area. I added them into both the Roadrunners group, because there's more people in the Roadrunners group that are going to Alaska, but then also into Alaska. And I did this primarily so that when we're on the trip, if I need to get a hold of, of Robert or Denise Beck, I can go into my iPhone, I can go into the phone contacts, and I can go to Alaska group and just see the people that are on the Alaska trip. What I really liked about this is you can pull this in, anything that you can select in a website, in a page, in a PDF, anything that you select can be populated into your contacts list without having to do custom paste. And it works damn near all the time. And it's about 15 bucks. I think that's really a great little utility. And by the same tokens, I'll talk about Fantastical. That's made by the same people. Um, and both of these have trials, so you can get a 30-day trial on, on them both. And Fantastical is available through the App Store, which is great because then everybody in your, ha in your house could use it. Um, I don't know if Card Hop's there yet, but it will be, I'm sure. But here's the cool thing about Fantastical is, let's say as an example, this is, again, a shortcut into the, into the calendar program. So I turn off the, I let the calendar program run. I just don't let it display anything. I turn off all the notifications from calendar. And let's say as an example, I've got a doctor's appointment on Monday. So I can put in uh, Dr. Uh, Katz, that's my, uh, my um, podiatrist. He's the one that takes care of, of what's left of my feet. And I can say in the orange office, Whoops. Now look what it's done. As I've typed this stuff in up here, it's, it's figured out, okay, this is the name. This is the location, because I said either at or in. So this is the location, so I already filled that out. It's grabbed the next coming Monday in two, in two days and populated that in. And I said at 10 a.m. And it's already added that in there. It, I have a default. My appointment defaults at one hour. It's already added that information in there. Boy, that beats going over to, uh, over to the calendar and manually typing in a new event every time. And then you can always come back and edit it. You can customize it and do whatever you want to. And if I didn't know if it was going to be Monday, I could say the third, I think it's bright enough to say the third Saturday. And it's already figured that out. Look at that, 317. So it's figured out the third Saturday of the month. It's pretty much real time text. And nowadays, Siri will do a lot of this for you as well. That's Fantastic Cal. And Fantastic Cal is available for not only the Mac, but also available for the iPad and the iPhone. And boy, on the iPhone, it's fabulous because I can be sitting there at the doctor's office and say, would you like to give me, would you like me to give you a reminder card? Why, I'll lose it as soon as I get home. But they'll say, well, we need to, we want you to come back on such and such. And I can just literally type that information in on the keyboard, the hunt and peck type, 
way that I work on my iPhone, and it'll populate, popular, uh, populate that information over there. So that's fantastic, Cal. Both these are available as a free demo for 30 days from uh, oh, Flexbits is the name of the company, Flexbit Software, but you can type in Fantastic Cal in Google and you'll find it. Those are two really super useful ones that I like. Okay, Composure, this is a little, this is a, a little uh, application that adds, um, that adds uh, frames and stuff around your existing photos. So if you got JPEGs or PDFs or whatever it is, it, all it does is just make a little custom frames if you want to give a little bit of fancier picture to somebody. Dashlane is kind of a, a, a little uh, utility, a dashboard type utility. Eh, it seemed okay. It's one of these things you got to play with a little bit and get used to. Debit and credit, if you're looking for a cheap and expensive, this is free from the App Store, uh, app to get into for keeping just uh, running tabs on maybe credit cards and things like that, that's what that's for. The poor man's quick, and I guess you can look at it. This doctor, th there's various versions of this, but this is a quick little utility available from the Apple menu uh, for giving you some super simple, um, oh, I got display menu in there twice, isn't that dumb? This is a freebie, uh, and I love this one. Let's bring that. I don't have it turned on at the moment, but I just did now. And here's what display menu does. I come up here and I pop this. Look at that. It shows me all the different resolutions that this monitor that I'm looking at can display. You can see due to my poor eyesight or whatever, um, I'm running at 1440 by 900, which is what my old power book defaulted to. This one defaults normally to 1920 by 1200. So of course that makes everything smaller on the screen, as you can see right there. Uh, I'm going to take it back, but there, there is a a, a quick way of getting to uh, back and forth. And where I really like to use this a lot is because it, um, if I'm working in Photoshop or something like that, and I can't zoom out far enough, well on this re on this uh, monitor, I can go out all the way out to 2880 by 1600 and see a lot more real estate. Now the text and everything is smaller. Of course, I can go into Finder preferences and make the text bigger. I can always go back and do that. But I just find that this is a convenient default icon size for me to work at. But if, I, if I've got a second display plugged in, it gives me access to those. You can do this by going to the system preferences, by going to display and dinking with it. Here's a quick free shortcut to be able to get to all this information, but you can always get over here to displays preferences if you want to as well. Display menu is really, really worth it, especially for the price. All right. There's been several programs over the years that I've talked about for, for YouTube videos. And I like, to, I like to rob a YouTube video or help video or something like that occasionally. That's what Downy is. And their third version of Downy is that I've used Xtube. is one that I've used in the past, iTube, Yank It. There's a, there's a lot of different ones. Downy is about $10, I believe. And again, it's got a 30-day trial. You can try it. And if there's a video that you're looking at YouTube, it's not only YouTube. Down, the one thing I like about Downey is it'll work with almost any video. So if you're in Vimeo or if you're in, um, oh shoot, I can't think of the one that, the one that begins with a D, the, the uh, Daily Motion. Uh, any video that you display on screen, you can, down, you can pretty much download with uh, Downey. So that's an interesting way of getting the video local onto your site. And it defaults to an MP4. You've got a little bit of choices with it, but it defaults to a regular Apple TV, Apple iTunes compatible format. You can choose it to go into your Apple uh, database or I keep them just separately in my movies folder until I decide whether, whether I'm going to watch them now or watch them later or whatever it happens to be. Duet. This is really a slick little program. I've used it. I've, I've shown it in the past. I've showed it when we had our uh, physical meetings. Duet's about $15. It's brought out. It was invented by a couple of guys that worked at at, worked at Apple at one time or another. There's other programs that are like this. Duet uses your iPhone or your iPad, but physically cable. So you're cabled in with the lightning cable. So you're now you're not you're not taxing network uh, going over Bluetooth or going over Wi-Fi to get a second display. I can take my iPad and put a and and have it extend my desktop or mirror my desktop onto my iPad or believe it or not onto my iPhone. So if you're working with something that's got lots of menus, Photoshop would be a good example. Affinity would be a good example. I can put my iPad, set it adjacent to my laptop here, because I'm only working with a 15-inch screen on my laptop, with you running Duet, drag all the menus over onto my iPad, 
And now I've got uh, the whole screen on the Mac being used for the image that I'm editing on and all the menu choices over here on the second screen, which happens to be my iPad, which doesn't get as much use except when I'm traveling, doesn't get as much use at all. There's a great way of getting multiple uses out of an iPad or an iPhone is to use this program Duet. The application for the PC, excuse me, the application for the iPad or the iPhone is free because you have to have the, the paid version. But again, they have a demo of the paid version of Duet and it's available from the App Store. So if you're looking a way to use that iPad or even your iPhone, because you at least put a few menus on the iPhone, Stand it next to, lay it on the counter or stand it next to your uh, Mac. That's a great way of getting some extra use out of those. File Juicer, I've shown this before. What this does, this takes literally any file, any kind of a file, and tears apart all the context. So it robs uh, out of an application, believe it or not. So it robs out all the artwork. So like all the artwork that's used to make up Fantastic Cow when we were looking at that. There's, there's the master menu when I bring that up. So every one of these pieces of art in here, that's all they are being displayed. Every one of those pieces of art, if I run it through file juicer, will be broken up. And so if you're working on an application and you happen to like a logo or maybe a picture that they've got or something like that, you could take that application, drag it to file juicer. File juicer will rob all the contents out of that into a separate folder showing GIFs, showing text, showing PNGs showing PDF, showing everything, and then you can go through and select it. It doesn't affect the program itself that you're robbing the content from, but it gets all the guts out of it. You could do the same thing with, by doing a command I, doing the show package content. That's a much, this is a much easier way of getting just stuff out of it. It's just some, something I use once in a blue moon. Here's another freebie filter utility for, for photos that comes from the Apple Store. This, I used this last month for the first time. I didn't have a flowchart program on the Mac um, that I was using anymore that I that I had. I Way back when, when I was doing this for the company. Okay, I'm going to say, we're going to say a new document. And I never, I never got serious into flowchart, so I never learned flowchart with Gantz and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to make up something really simple, you can't get much simpler than just, and I, I don't have any colors turned on right now, but but um, you've got all the choices to do whatever you want to do as far as rotating around. This is free. This is available from the app from the app store. So if you want to make up flowcharts, those those simple little flowcharts that uh, Bart had last week, I made those up for him. He sent out something that he hand scribbled uh, and sent it over as a PDF to me, and um, I slapped that together in a few minutes after figuring out the basics of how to use this flowchart program it's free can't beat the price here's another home budget program well worth looking into uh, eyeglasses I was showing that a little bit if you were doing a lot let's bring it back up if you're doing a lot with um, uh, FaceTime or um, in the case of zoom or ManyCam, like Robert and I both have that eyeglasses is a program that comes into upfront that allows me to tweak the colors, the lighting, the uh, gra the size, whatever I want to get into weird looking effects. So like, um, come on, it's bringing these up. So we're seeing a small version. I'm gonna change the display so you can see this a little larger. See how cool that comes in handy? So like I can come in here to the space alien and of course, it's not gonna. We're not gonna see it here the way I'm doing it right now because I'm, I'm not. I'm sharing the screen, so we're not gonna see it. Okay, but but I can come in here and I can make adjustments to brightness, to color, temperature, saturation, to contrast, to gamma, to sharpness. I can change the exposure from automatic to manual or whatever it is. Over here, I can come over to zoom and flip, and I'll go back over here to effects and turn that back to normal. Come over here to zoom and flip, and here I've got the option to rotate the image if I really wanted to or to mirror the image, or to zoom the image, which is what, I'm, what I've done right here. You can see I've, uh, I've got this zoomed up because my backdrop here is on a piece of cardboard. We finally crushed this piece of cardboard down to the point where it's not working too well anymore. So anyway, that's how that works. And it takes another, you have to be in a program that uses the FaceTime or 
a third party camera. If you had a, if you had another, I've got a, a, a couple other cameras that I can plug into this and I can actually come over here. It would actually give me the option to come on down here and pick whichever uh, camera I wanted. Uh, that's pretty handy. I'm gonna change my display back and get back up here more to normal. See how handy that, that little utility comes in right there? Okay. So that's how that works. That's about 14 or $15 as I recall, something like that. Um, iStat Mini. I've been using iStat for two or three years. And you can see that's what this is running up here at the top. You can see I'm seeing my CPU and I can pop on that and I can see I've got four CPUs in here. So I can see how much of it's being used by the system. And as I move, as I move the mouse around, I'm getting bigger graphs that I can look at either one hour, the last 24 hours, you can see dead spot when I was asleep, the last seven days, the last 30 days. This is all information that's available in Activity Monitor. It's just not as easy to get to. And as I scroll through here, I can see what my CPU temperatures are. I can see what's eaten up. The Zoom app is eaten up 176% of my 400% because I got four CPUs in here. The Windows Server, I can see all, I can see all how much memory is being used, how much the processor CPU, what the load averages are like. Now, there's a lot more stuff to display up here. I can come up here and I can look at memory. So like right now, I'm, I don't know why I'm looking at memory, why I'm using memory, but I've just been watching it for the last few days to see what things change. But over the 16 gigs of RAM that I've got here, plus I can see that eyeglasses is using one gig. Safari is using almost one gig. Carbonite Daemon, just the Daemon by itself. It's paused, Mario. It's using up half a gig and it's paused. That bugs me, but it doesn't seem to hurt anything, but it just bugs me. So I'll probably reconsider that. Um, I've also, I'm also displaying up here network. So I can see what my network traffic's like. So you, I can see what my, what my uh, IP address is. I'm physically connected with an ethernet cable right now, but here I can look at what my network traffic is like in the last 30 days, 24 hours, seven days, one hour, whichever. I come on down here and see what's using the, you know, I can see that right now my iPhone's not connected or the, th I'm not using, I, I am using the Thunderbolt firewire uh, at the moment, not the firewire connection, but I'm using the regular connection. Here we are, the Thunderbolt bridge connection, which is the one I'm using right now. So this is just part of it. Now, these little icons that you see down here at the bottom, this is activity monitor, if I'm not mistaken, we'll know here in a moment here. Or did I just kill it? I just killed it. There we are. Here's the actual iStat uh, option of what I can turn off and on. I can turn off and on notifications. This is for stuff to go up here in this menu. I can turn on weather, who cares about that? Uh, I can turn on my CPU and I've got it turned on. I can come down here to, I've got network selected right now. This is all the choices that you can set. So I can have eight or 10 of these little icons up here at the top, but of course they're eating up screen real estate. Well, this is about 20 bucks to have iStat menus. And there's even a version available for iPad and iPhone. And if you've got them for those, you can remotely monitor your Mac from your iPad or your iPhone or vice versa, go in the other direction. Here's a free version called iStat Mini gives you some of these options. This is available from the App Store. You can get that and give that a try. Uh, you can upgrade to the full version if you want to, or you can just keep the free iStat Mini. That's a, I love these little shortcuts. I use them constantly, especially like when I think something's hanging up or I want to see what's, what's eating up. You know, if everything slows down, I want to see what's eating up the most CPU. I can come up here and say, okay, well, I got two programs that are going. Maybe I can kill one of them or whatever or just quit it. Useful program. Keeper, that's a password keeper. If you're not using something like 1Password, and by the way, you can get 1Password through the App Store, and you can get a demo of it as well, a, a trial version of it. Keeper is an alternative, a free alternative to 1Password. There's a couple others here I'll show in a moment. Uh, Kindle, if you don't, if you use uh, uh, iBooks or um, uh, Amazon Books, uh, uh, Audible is what I was trying to think of. Kindle's another one that the, the reader is a free reader. And if I go into Kindle right now, you can see my wife and I share an account and she's found something. I, I wish I knew what it was. She's found it. She's going to test it out for us. But um, she found some website that allows you to get complete books that are free to read on your Kindle device that are free to read. 
Uh, and other times it's maybe the first three chapters of the book. So if, she, if it's a book she's thinking about, she can download the first three chapters. It'll take a moment here for it to uh, load in the artwork. There we go. So like these four books that are right here at the top, I would never get these, but what the hell? Uh, these are free. Here's, uh, here's a part that's free. This is a complete book that's free. This is free. This is free. A lot of these that you see in here are ones that she's downloaded and free. These are ones that I found off off of a, another website that I was able to download and get for her. She wanted the series of uh, Janet Ivanovich. These were all free. I don't know whether they're supposed to be or not, but they were in this particular case. So if you if you use Kindle or if you have a Kindle or the Kindle app for the Mac or the Kindle, a Kindle device or a Kindle app for iPhone or iPad, this is a quick way of getting into that and get a lot of free stuff. And I'll find that website that she's looking at. She's found two or three of those. I'll find that website that she's looking at that talks about that. Because I thought that was really cool to be able to get some, some free books or at least try them out. We've talked about that in the past, and this is free from the App Store or from Mac Tracker on the website. This has every piece of Apple hardware ever built, as far as I can tell. And so it's coming up right now. Uh, I don't even have, do I have a window open? Yeah, okay, so right now the categories I'm looking at is MacBook Pro. I can look at all models, but this is huge. So I can come over here and I can look at just stuff. Uh, come on, Speedy. So now we're looking at everything Apple's ever made. So in my case, I'm using a MacBook Pro. I'm, so I'm looking under MacBook, here we are, MacBook Pro. So I can see every MacBook Pro since the first one was shipped in 2006. And maybe I wanna see, well, what, you know, hey, I've got a MacBook Pro, it's a 17 inch. This is probably about the one that Robert and I are 2008, probably when they stopped making the 17 inch was what, 2009 it looks like. So if I get, if I double click, well, let's go back to something older. By the way, I can scroll up and down in these as I'm going through, here we go. So here's a MacBook Pro that was uh, uh, mid 2009. Here's general information about it. It shows when it was introduced, when it was discontinued, what the model identifier, Apple's got these goofy little, here's their model number, their goofy little codes. Um, the initial price, the suggested retail price, what it finally went for, if it went down in price, uh, its architecture, the number of cores that it had, its cache storage. As I'm looking in here, if I click on software, it shows here's the late, here's what it came with uh, operating system wise. Here's the latest operating system that it'll use, 10.11.6. And what, I, what am I on right now? So I'm on 10.13, so it can't go to High Sierra. So that would be Sierra and then 11. It's probably um, El Capitan was probably the last one that it could use. So that's a great way if you're looking for if you're looking to get a, a, a Mac or have, or you're trying to figure out what's the latest operating system I can upgrade to, this is free, Mac Tracker, and you get updates to it all the time. Every time Apple brings out a new product, this shows you what memory and graphics it's got built into it. This shows you what kind of network or uh, physical connections. If that particular unit came with one FireWire connection, two USB connections. They were the old USB one, which was limited to 480. Um, any any kind of some information, look at that, even a picture of the damn thing. Uh, and any kind of notes that you want to keep or whatever it is. This is a freebie. I highly recommend everybody should have this. It, by the way, it's available for a Mac, uh, for an iPad or for an iPhone. And it's the same database that's used on all three. So I keep it on my iPad and I keep it on my iPhone just in case somebody's got a, uh, or at least on my, uh, my iPad, in case somebody's got a question about something or other, I can quickly go to the iPad or to the Mac and look that information up. Really useful. Memory clean. I haven't run across a real serious use for this. It's a freebie from the App Store. Supposedly, if you've got a program that some older applications that run on Macs are sloppy about freeing up memory when you quit, and that's what this the whole program does. So if you're limited to one or two gigs of RAM in, in the particular computer that you're using, and maybe you've been using an older application, and it's not good about freeing up memory. The only way they ever seem to get all your memory back is to log out and log back in. Memory Cleaner will solve that problem for you. This is just an improved notebook utility. Um, I hardly use note. I hard, it's, a, it's like Apple's notes, only you can keep separate notebooks. So like I could, ha I could create a, a note 
notebook of maybe my movies and a notebook of maybe RV junk and a notebook of, and you can sort of do the same thing inside of notes, but it's a little klutzier. Of course, you know that pages, keynote and numbers is available for free if you've got a Mac that can run them, it's available for free through the App Store. So numbers can open up most, can open up any Excel file. It can save in its own native format or can save as a text or a comma separated value, which can be opened up in Excel or most other spreadsheet applications. Keynote can open up PowerPoint files. It can save out as Keynote native files or it can save out as a QuickTime movie. So you could build a keynote presentation and save it out as a QuickTime movie that could be played in a QuickTime movie player or even in PowerPoint as a QuickTime movie. So you have some options that believe you can edit or view PowerPoints inside of Keynote. So you can get a PowerPoint reader that's free if that was the case. And pages, you can open up Microsoft Word documents. You can save as Microsoft Word compatible documents or page documents. You can use it as a word processor but it was pretty much designed to be used as a page layout application. So that's its uh, claim to fame. Parcel, if you do a lot of things tracking UPS and FedEx, that's what this was designed to do. It hooks into there rather than happen to go to the website and do it, you can hook it in to track your packages automatically for, it, for there. Uh, here's a little simple uh, photo editor that's available. Um, Power Photos, this is available from, I'm trying to think of what their name was before. Uh, I guess we could bring it up. It's big claim to fame. This is the version that, that now works with uh, uh, the current version of uh, Apple's Photos is no longer called iPhoto. It's called Photos. And I'm not, that's my uh, finger not working too well here. Let's open that up. Where this really comes in handy, and I've run across this a lot, is you might, oh, there's a newer version. Well, we'll remind me later. So what this will do is this can look into your libraries without having your library open, into your photo libraries. So like for the longest time, I was keeping uh, Marsha's photo libraries, my library, uh, gag photos that I got off the internet, work-related photos. I had multiple libraries. And the, the, um, the, the, the way you would get into different libraries when you, you know, by default, when you open up photos, it goes in, or even iPhotos, when you open up photos, it went into the, de quote, default library. You could open up, you could create multiple libraries, rename them to something else um, in, in the photos application, even in the old iPhotos application. So I could, I could take a, I could make a start off with a brand new photos library and make up one called Marsha, and that would be, and put all her digital photos or scanned photos or whatever into that one. When I quit, when I quit photos, it's called default library. Rename it to Marsha's photos. Next time I go into photos, it doesn't see it. He wants to create a brand new library or navigate to a photos library. I could do it that way, or I could hold down the option key, which would force it to do that. This is going to take a while because I haven't done this for a while. What this is really convenient. This allows you to switch between one library or another library on the fly, and it allows you to merge libraries. So if, as an example, on a backup, I've got a library, and then I've got a backup from two or three years ago, and I don't want to import all the contents of that library, I can, I can drag one library on top of another library. That's why you're still seeing them here at the moment. I'm going to bail out of this. And merge two or three or four or five libraries together into one unified library or even break them out. I can create a new library there separately if I just... Now that Marsha's photos are just in a separate album inside my library, my photos library, I can open up, I can remotely log on to her computer or drag a copy of her photos library over and just add them into a, keep another backup copy of them. It allows you to manipulate stuff an awful lot. And I think that program, again, you can get a 30 day trial. I think that program goes for about 20 bucks if I'm not mistaken. Printopia, this is about 20 bucks. You can get a trial of this one as well. What Printopia does, Printopia lets you print anything that you normally can't print. So you, yeah, sure, okay, I haven't used it for a while. So what do we got going down here? Why are you upside down? I am upside down, okay. 
that must have been something I did when I was fooling with iPod. I'll fix that in just a moment. What are you, what are you drinking? <laughs> Probably when I was playing around with that. Let's go ahead and fix this. Let me get that right now. Ah, uh, you're halfway up. There you go. Yep, see, I didn't bother to show it's th that eyeglasses utility lets you do goofy things like that. Okay, uh, I'm going to start the seven-day free trial. I know I've got a license, but I don't know where it's at right now. <laughs> Pintopia. Okay. So this lets me... Um, I don't know why you couldn't get on. I don't either. So when you're done there, I will show you what I did and what I need to do. What this is, is this is a print server utility. And it allows you to print from iPads, iPhones. So if you don't have a, a, a printer that has the uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi capability built in, or an iPad or an iPhone to talk directly to it, you can use this this utility to talk with your Mac, to talk to any printer, and as long as your Mac's up and running, you'll be able to use your iPad or your iPhone and print through your Mac to that printer. And that's oh, the way that works. I don't really use this so much anymore since I've got a printer that solves that problem. But anyway, that's a way of getting around that. Shazam, people are more, probably more familiar with this with the, for, a, for a iPad or an iPhone. When you're playing music, this is a freebie. When you're playing music, you can on the Mac or the piece or on the Mac or on the iPad or the iPhone, you can touch Shazam, and it will listen to what music's playing and identify it, and almost get it every time. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to go ahead and unmute and unmute everybody right now for the time being. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, I'm trying to talk over. If you need to ask a question, just go ahead and ask. Uh, but you'll have to unmute yourself. Printopia, so you print from the iPad or the iPhone. You want to? If you don't have, if you have no way of printing directly to your printer now, this will this will turn your Mac into a print server to allow you to do that. And again, there's a 30 day trial of it. Okay, I'll hold off on this for the time being. All Let's right, see. let's see what else real quick. Uh, simple note, another note taking application. Sketchbook. This is a freebie from Adobe. And um, you can get this through the App Store, or you can get it directly from Adobe. That's kind of cool. It is a, it's just like exactly what it sounds like. I think it's a way of getting you to get into Adobe products so they can eventually sell you something down the road. But it's a nice little sketcher utility, uh, well worth getting just to play with, if nothing else. And it's totally free, available from the App Store. Sketch, I've never used this before. What Sketch is, Sketch is a creativity thinker is what they call it. Um, the whole idea is you can put in a couple of topics you're talking about, maybe RV or something like that, or maybe food or whatever. And Sketch looks through a, a couple of databases and gives you other other possibilities that might make you think of other things to do Google searches on or whatever. Kind of handy. Sparkle, this is another uh, uh, photo editing a tweak to add a little class or a little highlights to photos if you want to. Text Wrangler, this has been free available for the last couple of years. It's made by the same people who make BB Edit, which is one of the best uh, editors out there for doing scripting. That is text editor, text wrangler. Think of like it's like sort of like the, the old teach text or just text as Apple calls it now on steroids. Really, really great, and it's a freebie now. Unarchiver. If you've ever run across files that have got a .zip app, uh, uh, extension on the end of them, or even a .tar. Is, that's a Unix carrier for tape archiver. Uh, the an archiver is a freebie. That's something everybody should keep in their group, in their uh, toolbox. Because if you run across one of those files, the unarchive won't won't archive them for you, but it will unarchive damn near any file format that's out there. Apple now does a lot of that by itself, built in. Wi-Fi Explorer, just like it shows. If you fingers not working so good here, come on, let's bring this up. And Wi-Fi is off. Sure, let's turn it back on. Okay. 
So it's showing the Wi-Fi that are available in my area. I'm only, right now I'm only picking up uh, two different ones. I'm picking up the one that I'm hooked into, which is me, and then obviously a neighbor's um, because my reception here inside this house, this house is um, very limited from, from a, a Wi-Fi standpoint because it's got aluminum wiring. It was built in the 70s when copper was at a premium and they were trying to figure out ways of saving money. So they experimented for two or three years with aluminum wiring in the house. The only copper wiring that exists is in the bathroom or around the circuits that are around water that are on ground fault interrupter. Everything else is on aluminum wiring. That's fine. The problem is with aluminum wiring is if you flex a wire two or three times, it breaks. That's a drawback. You have to use big, it's, it's a heavier gauge wiring. So if you were normally using a 12, this is like a 10 or an eight. I forget exactly what it is. If you go to buy, if you go to change out the wall plugs or wall sockets, they do not recommend you using the regular copper wall plugs and wall sockets. They recommend you using the ones made for aluminum wiring, which of course are two or three dollars more per unit. So the only way you can get any kind of a break is to buy a batch of them. I did when we bought this house 20 years ago, we upgraded everything almost everything to the newer style wall plugs and light switches. And I bought a case of each, I bought a box of 12 in order to be able to get a break on these things through Home Depot. So you can see a couple other websites are showing up. So my cellular reception, if I walk outside my sliding glass door here, I get about, I get about three to four bars. If I come inside the house, I'm right near the door, I'm getting between one and two bars. Certain spots of the house, I'll get one bar and sometimes nothing exam nothing at all unless I rotate the phone a little bit because this aluminum wiring is acting like what's called a Faraday cage or a, a copper cage around this house. All homes have the problem a little bit. This has got it even worse. Uh, luckily, I'm in, I'm in the same room that my Wi-Fi repeater is in, so it's not a problem and it, it's not going through much, but that's why I'm not picking up. If I went outside, I'd pick up 10 or 15 networks. So this is a free Wi-Fi utility you can get through the app store to see who else is around. You can see this information when you go into system preferences and go over to network, but here you can see a little bit more information like what frequency it's on, uh, what their strength is. I think I've got a few more menu choices there, whether they've given it a name or not, the last time you updated it. You can get a lot of information on this and it's a freebie. I use one called Kismac, which I've had, which I've owned for years. And Kismet was the original one for PC. Kismac is the one for Macintoshes, but you pay for that one. So if this was available, I would have used this one, but it's available now and it is, it is a freebie. Yeah, I don't want to say this. Uh, finally, the last three down here are, are the last, this is a utility for yanking bits and pieces out of other things. But here is a free pinball game that's out there. I played this before, it's a lot of fun. And here's a tank game that's out there that's free and it's pretty cool and they've got a lot of interesting things and uh oh i mean if we go back over to what i did is i just went through and looked through all these that were now if you see the word you can see a lot of these have got a price of course i'm just i'm right now i can actually search on these for just free apps if i want to there's actually here we are great free app great doesn't mean all means great these are apps that are available um, that are all free. Whenever you see the word get, that means you don't have it lo loaded on your Macintosh at the moment. When you see the word open, that means you currently have it on your Macintosh. If you see the word install, that means you've had it at one point in time. It's not there right now, and if you click on it, it'll just reinstall it. That's all. You can see the nice thing is with these shortcuts, you can see the, the ratings that they had. If you click on the name or click on the app, it'll take you right to that app and you can read some information, maybe even see some screenshots about it. And so like as an example here, I can see screenshots to get an idea of this, is this photo editor and what all it can do. So again, for free, how can you go wrong if you're looking to do something? Basically, this is the things that it can and can't do. And here you can see what the ratings are and what people said about it. Here we go. This guy's saying it's great for a, for a light version with a few, wishes it had more junk in it, but hey, it's free. So, you know, can't have everything, but it's free. A lot of these will have paid 
a lot of the freebies will have paid uh, upgrades to get you into a more robust version. If you go into 1Password, if I type in 1Password here, it's it'll give you it'll give you a basic 1Password to start off with. As you can see, see it's, it's showing right now, Apple considers this an essential one. It's saying right now that I can get this. I have a paid version of 1Password that I bought directly from the from the Agile Bits folks. So that's why I've, I've still got this option here to go ahead and get it and download the free version if I wanted to. Um, so I definitely recommend you go out there and, and, and look around. By the way, you know, you can always, I'm going to get out of this. You can always go to um, Google and you can type in something as lame as um, free Macintosh software. Free app. What is it called? Free app? Uh, no. I like yours better. Free Macintosh. I think that's what it was. And there you'll get, you'll get, look at that. Three free Mac OS apps every Mac user should have. This is sponsored by Macworld, so it's got to be halfway decent that uh, they're recommending. Uh, here's free apps recommended by iMore. iMore. If you watch Mac Break Weekly, which is a podcast that Leo Laporte puts out every Tuesday, every Monday or every two, every Tuesday, I think it is Monday. I forget which. Um, and I watch that on a regular basis. Of course, he's on. He's on right now on KFI 6:40 a.m. or on the uh, uh, on the uh, what do they call it? The Tech Guy, Mac the Tech Guy, where you go yeah. to Twit T W I T. These are the ones that I, iMore is one of the guys that's on his show, Rene Ritchie from iMore.com in Canada. These are the apps that they recommend. Here's the Mashable, another Mac popular website that they recommend. They'll all have links to all these apps. Here's what digital trends. Now you're gonna find a lot of overlap between all these. But here's the Verge, this is the eight best that they think you should have. That doesn't mean they're free. That just means what they, they recommend. Um, CNET is a pretty safe bet to get stuff from, for the most part. I've never had a problem with them. Um, I've gotten stuff from open source. Open source is very good. This is where you get things like, uh, uh, um, what do I want to say, GIMP, the Graphic Image Manipulation Program. Could they come up with a more difficult name than that? Or how about Open Office? As I've said before, Microsoft Office is going to be, eventually it's going to be subscription only. That'll be the only way you'll be able to use it on any current Macintosh. And even though Pages can open and save uh, uh, Macintosh or Microsoft Word files, um, and uh, Keynote, excuse me, not Keynote can open up PowerPoint, and um, what do I say? Numbers can open up Excel. They can't necessarily save back in them. But if you get Open Office, which is a freebie from uh, open source Mac or from it's available from op from multiple locations. Open Office, and I've showed it before, has built in a word processing program that's probably 99% compatible with uh, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, what do they call their, their uh, flow charting program, I forget what it's called. But it's got about six or eight programs. It's sort of like what Apple, what was the one that Apple used to have way back when, when they were, where they had all their integrated applications together. It's along the same lines, and um, you can see if you just do, if you if you just go uh, free paid Mac apps, I like that best free paid Mac apps. If you just do a Google search on free Macintosh applications, boy, that'll get you in the ballpark. And if they're recommended by any, especially any of these ones up here towards the top, um, I would say MacWorld is a safe. This one's an ad sponsor, so you never know what you're going to get there. But for Macworld a Magazine or iMore or Mashable or The Verge or Digital Trends, any, and you're probably going to find, you can always open up multiple tab sessions and see if they recommend one versus the other and to give you some ideas of where, where to go for it. And uh, that'll give you a spot to at least start off with. We got any questions here I can answer or ruin or screw up? or Yeah, Bob, what's up? Um. Now, Leo Laporte himself has said that uh, the CNET download is a problem sometimes. 
Yes, it has been downloading uh, malware. So uh, the only time I would get, the only time I would get from uh, CNET is if it's not available anywhere else. But it's a good place to go to give you a name, and then you can take that name and type it into a Google search and see who else is offering it. One that I've downloaded for a long time was uh, Two Cows, T U C O W S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, they're a they're a safe bet. To, I think they're a safe bet. They've been around since the inception of Macintosh days, and uh, and that would be my first choice uh, to get from. Download.com is okay, but I'm using these places more as a reference. If you went to any of those websites, like through iMore or through MacWorld, they're going to have links to a safer spot. Mm -hmm. CNET. The only thing CNET's really good for, as far as because I, I feel the same way you do, is to give me some suggestions of what to go look for and then see if I can get it from somebody else. They're my, they're my last place to go download stuff right now because of all the bad press they've got. They may have solved it, but it's going to take a while for that to come back. And I have nothing against getting anything from open source um, because they available, that is, uh, they're available for Linux, for PC, for Mac, for whatever. I never had a problem with them. They've got some moderators that do a lot of, uh, uh, volunteering to check to make sure the stuff is uh, good to work with what's the name of that again open source.org okay thank you and like i said that's where you can get open that's one of the few places you can get open office from you can just type in open office and it'll take you there sourceforge.net's another safe place to usually get stuff from and um gimp if you're looking for a near photoshop capable but it's a klutzy interface it's better than it used to be and that's GIMP, the Graphic Image Manipulation Program. <laughs> Used to be that every every window you open, everything you wanted to do in GIMP, you had a menu, so you, you had a window. So you thought Photoshop had a lot of windows. GIMP had maybe 50 or 60 windows, because back in the old PC days, that was the only way they could do it. And now the later versions of GIMP that have come out, they've immigrated it more into one window connecting to another window, connecting to another window, so you don't have that you don't have all those all over your screen. But hey, if you got an iPad, put your iPad up, get yourself Duet and put those extra menus over there on uh, on your iPad and use that as your second monitor. Especially if you're working with a little 15-inch screen like myself. So Anything else anybody? The uh, Wi-Fi Explorer was free. That's free and that's available from the App Store or should be. I'm, I'm looking right at it. It's 20 bucks. It must oh. be the trial I downloaded that. It must be a trial for it because I know I didn't buy it. Hmm. So is that on the App Store? Is that where you're looking at, Bob, or on uh, oh, yeah. Google? At the App Store, yes. yes. At the App Store? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, I noticed, that, I noticed for the first time that the App Store is now starting to show uh, trial software where you can download software that has 30 days or seven, or you get to use it seven times or whatever. So you might do a Google search on Wi-Fi Explorer and see if from their website, you can get a trial of it. Because somewhere along the line, I had it and I know I didn't buy it. Like I said, I've, I've bought a couple others in the past. The one I use most of the time is Kismac and there's one other one that I use, but, uh, but if it's something you can use all the time, even a twenty dollar investment might not be bad. But you can also, but you can always, you can always type in something like Wi-Fi. Show in the Google search bar. Show me Wi-Fi uh, network applications. Something like something like that, and you're going to see a slew of stuff. And believe me, they'll they'll identify it if it's free or not, or have a trial or trial Wi-Fi exploring exploring software, and you'll see. Google amazes me that if you can just get the damn, we were watching something last night and I was watching a Carl's Jr. ad and I said to my wife, that voice sounds like Matthew McConaughey. She goes, nah, that's not Matthew McConaughey. He wouldn't do that. He's already doing Mercury and a bourbon. And I went over to Google. I typed in, is Matthew McConaughey doing Carl's Jr. commercials? Voice over Carl's Jr. commercials. By golly, about eight sites came up and said, yeah, Matthew McConaughey signed a deal to be able to, and apparently he's using his own verbiage to him, so he's calling him swishy, dishy, lucky, goosey, loosey. He's putting his own, they're pretty much giving him a guide to go by, and they're letting him use his, you know, kind of Texas drawl or whatever to kind of, they're trying to get away from the hot-looking chick that they've been using for their ads in the, over the years, and they're phasing those out, and they're trying something different using Matthew McConaughey, so I 
I got my wife on that one because I was sure that was his voice that I had heard. So it just amazes me. You can type as mu you can type stuff like that into Google, and if you ask it as a question and even put a question mark on the end, sometimes that narrows the search a little bit more. But at least it'll give you a starting point. So that's really good from that from that I think. All right. Anything else? Anybody else want, got anything they want to talk about or or do? How do I? Can you hear me? Sure. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah. Okay. Uh, earlier in the program, you mentioned you wanted to get a GoPro. Uh, yeah. I have a Geek Pro. I paid ninety nine bucks for it. It's just as good as the GoPro. On really? Amazon. Yeah. And it's called Geek Pro. Geek Pro. Damn! I'll have to look at that. Okay. Check it out. I will do that. Geek Pro. Cool. The, the 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 real advantage that GoPro's got going for it is there's so much crap that everybody makes for it. Uh, is the Geek Pro similar in size, or can it use some of the GoPro accessories or whatever? It uses it's identical. Oh, so I've it's a, a, a box, I've got a whole box of toys. The, oh, cool. The extender, the underwater uh, oh, helmet, great. every attachment you can imagine. Boy, there sure is, besides drones, there sure is a ton of videos, and almost everybody who's doing YouTube videos, they're either going the super cheapo route with an iPhone, because they already got that, and it's doing the job, or now the new push with the Samsungs or whatever it is, because they've got that super, super, super slow-mo. I don't know how many times you'd use that feature. Or they're, or they're using a GoPro. That's probably 90% of the YouTube videos that they're being created are being done with, with one or the other of those. Yeah, but check into it. Uh, I have a friend that cherish um uses the drones about it. it's it's about the future about a young man of course right because i'm sorry bob would you what were you saying he's king i just started listening to leo yeah, his world program world. just it's kind of messed up uh, yeah, that's why I usually watch this on the podcast after the fact. I usually watch Leo later because I, I, I'm usually doing something else or I'll just listen to it in the background. I mean, the Saturday, his Saturday show doesn't have a whole bunch of Mac stuff in there, but he does get into He's mentioned our website in there a couple of times. He's mentioned this. I asked a question and I said, I hope, I said that I co-host this and he gave us a plug for it, but uh, I'll take whatever we can get since it's not costing anybody anything. What the hell? You know, just a little bit of time, so. All right, guys. Well, that's pretty much about it. Unless you've got something else, um, I'm hoping I'm hoping that one of the three people that I had for today can can join us for either April or May. May will be the last time that I'll be able to do that. that I'll be able to host this. I'm trying to get Deborah Shadowitz to do one, and I've got one other person. I'm trying to think of his name. One of the vendors. Come June, July, and August, I'll be traveling. And if I'm not driving that Saturday morning, I'll still do this um, and just work around it. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll try to con Steve or Robert into hosting this. And I'll just try to connect on audio wise or whatever if I'm driving or whatever. But I haven't looked at, I'll know this weekend, our schedule, our trip schedule for the for my Alaska trip will be broken down a little more definitive. And I'll get an idea of where, uh, where I'm going to be. Uh, what day. I, I know where we're going to be. I just don't know what times are going to be there. But supposedly he'll have it more broken down this Sunday when we get together with the group down in Chula Vista. So, have you been to Alaska before? We did a cruise twice. Uh, we did a cruise uh, once there, and um, gosh, that was like twenty. Where well, we're coming up on twenty-five years. So that was twenty-six years ago that Marsh and I, with two other couples, cruised from Van. Uh, crew, we flew to Anchorage, yeah. went out to um, uh, Port Whittier. In fact, they hadn't even opened the road all the way to Port Whittier. They were still going by train. Now they've opened, now they've run the canal in closer. But you used to have to go out to Port Whittier to take the cruise ships and then come south. And we, and we did that. And that was great. But that was 25 years ago. And I've always wanted to do the drive. My folks did the drive with other people, with, with uh, other couples, twice. But it's been like 20 years ago since they did it. And uh, my understanding is nowadays the roads are, they, the Alaska Highway, they pretty well keep up. And the other one that we're going to come back on, they pretty well keep it up all the time because they're getting so much they're getting so much tourist up there they want to keep it as good as they possibly can so the group that i'm going with there'll be a total of 21 rvs they're all the same brand we're going with an rv group so at least you've got the advantage and we're gonna the guy has thought it out to the point where we're going with we're gonna break into like groups of five 
uh, or groups of four or groups of five RVs. And so one group will take off at eight, next group will take off at 8.30, next group will take off, that kind of deal. And we're all going to have, um, the group leader is going to have either a cell phone, um, but they're trying to get every, they're trying to get everybody to get these little cheapy uh, UHF radios. You know, they're like $30, $40. We've got a pair of them uh, we're going to take, and that way we can loan one out to somebody or whatever. So th at least in the mini group, you've got communication. And if something serious happens, we've, they're renting um, sat phones for the leaders of the group. And um, at least if you break down, you've got people with a lot of experience that got the same kind of RV you've got that might be able to help you out. So I've still got to get, um, I signed up for a supplementary good SAM just in case. And my regular insurance, which offers towing, I think is progressive. They're okay in Canada. But you never know where you break down what kind of, what, what you are going to get or not going to get as far as cell service or whatever. You know, that's always a possibility. And I, I and several other people in the group have a cell booster. That'll help. But, and I've got a Wi-Fi booster as well that I put when I get to campgrounds or whatever. But uh, just in case, I mean, I'll get, I have, we have two more four day, four day trips planned. This one coming up at Chula Vista Sunday. And then uh, the second Sunday of, uh, of uh, April, we're going out to Vegas with the uh, national rally. So there'll be about 80 or 100 RVs from, of this brand out there for that one. And that'll be for four days also. So have a blast. I hope so, Ray. All right, guys. Well, good talking to you. It was a short meeting, but I hope you had some fun. And we'll Thank see you, you next month. Okay. Have a Thank good you one. Very much. Bye bye. Thank you.